Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to see so many of you here. Richard Reeves, a man of, we can't say few words, certainly an intellectual journalist. We know that um, he's a senior lecturer at USC School of Communication. He uh, is a trained mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer at the age of 23 decided he wanted to start writing. So what he did, he uh, founded the Phillipsburg Free Press in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. And for 35 years, he's written a column. And that column has been in 160 newspapers and websites. He stopped writing these columns in 2014. And, you know, what brought about this book? He's, he's been interviewed many times, Charlie Rose being one. But um, he, he spent four years researching and writing this book. And he obviously spent hours and hours putting this together. What motivated him to write this book? And he said the events of 1942, the roundup and the incarceration of innocent American Japanese will always be relevant when there's fear in the land. History repeats itself from the treatment of British sympathizers after our revolution, the trail of tears, slavery, and repeated prejudice against immigrants. Today's fears focus on Muslim Americans, and that's why I thought it was the right time to look into the dark corners of our history, and he certainly did. I mean, he's brought to life things that perhaps we had read about and Certainly, um, I won't say look the other way, but the leaders in our land made it that way. Just a little um, more about Richard. He's worked uh, extensively on TV and in film. He was the chief correspondent on Frontline. He's made six television films. He's won all of television's major documentary awards. and. Um, He's won uh, uh, an award, the Peabody Award for Red Star over the Khyber for PBS. He's appeared in two feature films, which I thought interesting, Dave and Seabiscuit. So um, I'll just close in saying that um, he, the New York Library named him a literary lion, and I think we can agree after reading this book that he certainly loves words. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Steve, how many years has it been since we've known each other? A very long time. I think I met you when you were probably in High school, no, college maybe. High school. High school? <laughs> what did I look like? I had dark hair, didn't I? <laughs> I got this bio at 12.30 last night on Steve. I said, what were you doing up at that hour? <laughs> Should be in bed asleep. He said he had gone to get his daughter Joy at the airport, right? So I'm going to need to read this because it's pretty impressive and I want you to hear it. <clears throat> Steve Yamaguchi served as dean, serves as dean at Dean of Students and assist, associate, Assistant Professor of Practical Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary. He recently served 11 years at the Executive Presbytery for the Presbytery of Los Ranchos. And that's when I really got to know Steve, because we worked very closely together in some very interesting situations. Yes, a lot of interesting situations. Prior to that, he was ordained in 1988 to serve as a pastor at a Japanese-American Presbyterian congregation on Compton Boulevard on the east side of Compton that redeveloped from a few beleaguered members into a vibrant and growing intellectual, multicultural congregation. He served there at Grace Presbyterian Church for 15 years. He earned the MDiv from the uh, Princeton Theological Seminary and the DMIN from Claremont School of Theology and the BA from Westmont. 
where he has served on the Board of Trustees for the 20, for 23 years. I didn't know that. Wow. He also uh, studied at Fourth Theological Seminary, Gordon-Conwell, Harvard Divinity School. He taught as adjunct professor and served on the Board of Trustees of San Francisco Theological Seminary. He's married to Allison, a pediatric, pediatric physical therapist who still plays volleyball on two city league teams, and this year completed her first triathlon. Yay, Allison. Yeah. Let's see, they have two delightful uh, creative dancing daughters. The younger Joy is a junior at Brown University who spent this summer interning with the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless. The older Lydia is a recent Brown graduate who begins work with Food Cop Corps in Oakland this fall. Steve loves to bicycle and commute home by bike from, by, by, by bike from Pasadena to Long Beach where they've lived for over 25 years. Steve still plays the guitar in the Orange Praise Ensemble at New Hope Presbyterian Church, an African-American multicultural new church development in Orange. May I introduce my friend, Steve Yamaguchi. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Betty and I have known each other for so many years, but in that period when I was the executive presbyter, Betty kind of helped save my save my life well, at that's times. Too much. No, it was uh, she was such a great encouragement. I couldn't have done that without her. Um, I am so glad that you're here and that you're interested in this. Uh, I'm very interested in this for various personal reasons. I was, however, I was born in 1953, so I am not a survivor of the camps. Uh, my mother and father clearly are, and my life has been very much shaped by the experience of being their child. Uh, there are many in my generation, and there are a number of us from my generation here, there are many of us who, uh, or I have many in my age cohort who grew up never hearing about camp. All they heard about was that it happened until they went to college. And the period when I went to college was right when, I mean, the, the civil, it was, there was a very heightened civil rights consciousness, uh, 1971 to 1975. Um, student activism was huge. Ethnic studies were on the rise. Um, it, was a, it was a heady time, but I went to college with people, Japanese Americans, who'd never heard of this before except their parents went to camp, and they thought their parents got to go canoeing and <laughs> rafting for three years, and they thought, that sounds wonderful. And they were shocked when they got to college, and they learned what happened. And of course, it made them confused, but it made them angry, and it made them <coughs> indignant, and, and so people in, in my generation have had lots of different experiences of learning about this. I grew up very blessed by wonderful parents who told stories about camp. I remember growing up regularly at the dinner table, hearing about incidents that had happened in camp. So I, I grew up with a fairly vivid picture of certain things, but for actual, very few actual photographs, until in the 60s there was a book published called America's Concentration Camps, by Alan R. Bosworth. He was a Navy captain, and he, he published a book with photos, and as far as I know, I think it's one of the first books like that. It was one of the only books like that for many years. And even Richard Reeves, I noticed, I looked at, and, and I scanned the Kindle version. It, it doesn't make any, any mention of Bosworth's book, um, and it's kind of lost in, in obscurity, but you can find it on, um, you can find it on Amazon, and, and it's, it's amazing in its prescience, given the whole history of things. Now, one of the great treats of today, I think, is that my mother is here. Yes. Uh, and she actually, um, she and my father both uh, were, they were interned in camps, 
and they are living survivors. Is there anyone else here who was a camp survivor who would be willing to acknowledge? Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, you must have been a baby baby in camp. <laughs> but, <laughs> But my picture in camp. Oh, oh, oh wow. that's you! Oh my goodness! Wow! Oh, may, may, may I hold that up? Joyce Nakamura Okazaki. And I also attend Grace first. Wow! That's a lady. How wonderful. <coughs> well, this is Born Free and Equal. It is, uh, it's photos by Ansel Adams, and it was reissued about... 2001. 2001. But yeah. it was originally published in 1944. Yes, it was originally published by Ansel Adams. Uh, he was one of a couple of photos. Dorothy Lang was another professional photographer who commissioned, and Ansel Adams shot at Manzanar. So you were at Manzanar. My actual my portrait and my mother and sister's portraits are in there. Wow. Yeah. wow. And we're one of the few that he uh, captioned with our names. Wow. Because wow. most of it is. That is, and you're at Grace First now. Yes, I, I, I did teach a couple of adult ed classes there. That is wonderful. I, I used to be the pastor at that church. <laughs> but, but you. Uh, I joined after you. Yes, I'm so happy to know that you're there. Well, that's wonderful. Ansel Adams' pictorial book was published and then it disappeared. Uh, stories are told that the army, I've been told, or some government agents um, swept the country and bought them up and destroyed them. That is the story, but they are very hard to find. I remember when I was studying at Princeton, I tried to find a copy in the Firestone Library at the university, and there was one copy, it was on reserve, you had to make a special request just to see it, but it was missing. It was missing for all my three years there. I think someone probably stole it. But um, it's very, I, I've never actually seen a copy of the original, uh, but it, it's very exciting. You have one? I do have it at home. Wow. I, I take this around. I would it, love to see. This one is out of print now, and so that yeah. you can't find it. Anymore. Yeah, we have a copy of that too. We got it when uh, when it first came out at the UCLA Book Fair. Very good. Yeah. So I wanted to introduce my mother, uh, Miki Michiko Yamaguchi, and she is going to read uh, something that she prepared for a group at her uh, at the community where she lives in Lake Forest. Um, but I thought I might introduce her family also. Uh, she's here with her husband, uh, Bill William Satoshi Yamaguchi. <laughs> Bill is a, a native of Salinas and he is a, uh, uh, he, he's a survivor of the uh, Gila River, one of the Gila River camps in southeast Arizona. And uh, he left camp during the war because he graduated from high school and he was able to be in college at the University of Denver uh, while his family stayed in camp. You may remember from the book that Governor Ralph Carr was the only governor in the western states who would not restrict Japanese Americans from his state. It was said that he had, um, he was considered someone with presidential possibilities, but that was the end of his political career. He is, uh, he is very appreciated by the Japanese American community, and there is actually, a, a, I think it's a full-size uh, statue, a memorial of him, erected by the Japanese American community in Denver. But uh, my, my father uh, was, was in uh, Gila River, but my mother was, uh, went to the San... Well, she's going to tell you about that story. I, I would just like to introduce some of her family. Um, my sister is... Oh, my brother is here also. My sister, Karen, <laughs> is the middle child. I'm the oldest. And my brother, Kent, is in the back. He was uh, in the news recently for... Uh, <laughs> 
he says, yeah, Tarzan. for Tarzan invading his zoo, he's, a, he's the director of the Santa Ana Zoo. And I, I hear you were, your clip was on Jimmy Fallon the other night, but I, I haven't heard it yet. Um, and then my daughter, my, our younger daughter, Joy, is here. Our older daughter, Lydia, is up uh, north right now. And then um, we also have some others. Um, it, these are offspring of, of the Yoshida family, my mother's family. Uh, oh, and my cousin Jennifer is here, who's the uh, niece of my father, my father's brother's daughter. My mother has an older uh, sister, uh, Eileen Fusae, who, uh, whose daughter, Linda Hayashi, is here with her husband, Rex. And uh, must be Rex's sister. Okay, I heard you were coming. Great to have you here. And uh, my mother had a younger, uh, a younger sister, whose son is uh, Roy David Vaughn, and his lovely wife, wife Kate. And uh, who else is here? Am I missing somebody? All right. Well, um, I think it's a great treat to hear from my mother. I would like to let her share her story with you. And then uh, we can respond to her story as well as, as to the things in the book that you've brought. I'm sh I hope that it's elicited questions, but uh, I want to make sure that while we're fresh, we give our best time to my mom. So, mom, <laughs> would you please come and share? Thank you. Thanks, mom. Any questions for my mom? Chris? Yes, my question is, uh, what did you do with your anger? What did you do with your anger? I'm not that angry. I had so many friends. We had things going up in camp, and I was younger too. I think if I had more things, you know, I, I don't think I was ever angry. Mm -hmm. It was something just happened. She couldn't be angry. I would just make myself sick or something if I got angry. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mom, could you come here and talk here so that we can record this? Oh. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, my question is just from the members of the, that were in the camp, have you had any sort of uh, gatherings together? Is there any sort of contact, camaraderie for having hmm. gone through what you went through? Good question. Is there any sort of post-camp um, activities or organizations? Friendships? Well, I don't think... Do, do, cousins. Oh, the cousins group, yes. There is there is a group that we get together and have meals together, like dinner, you know, or lunch. But not everybody and this Jew in a certain area went to camp. There, there is one nice story. My mom has a friend that she went to elementary school with before camp. And you still keep in touch with her, right? Uh, I can't remember her name. You have lunch with her from before camp. Oh, Judy. No. Judy. Oh, Chidori. Oh, Chidori, yeah. Chidori, yeah. yeah. Yes. She's not here, is she? No. No, she's not here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, Judy. Yeah, this is for Steve. Steve, do you, did you know your grandparents? Yes. And did you ever hear anything from what they said? And they must have been very special, kind, uh, underst I mean, amazing people. Very amazing. I'm going yeah. to tell you a story about how amazing they are, Good. were. Uh, but <laughs> one of the things that, uh, w one of the dynamics in our, in our extended family is that um, those of us who were born in the post-war years grew up in an era when um, the country was still hostile towards Japanese Americans. Uh, even though I wasn't born until the 50s, uh, that endured. And, uh, and it did dissipate 
through the 60s and into the 70s somewhat in terms of its public expression. What's fascinating is that I'm, well, if I tell my age, I'll reveal your age. <laughs> I'm, I, I was born in 53. So my sister's born in 57, 56. Oh, you're even older. <laughs> and, then, and then my brother, except she looks like she's 35. It's really Look at that. Can you, so how old are you? I'm 59. 59. Wow. And then my brother uh, was born in 60. We all, I think we all have a different experience of this, though. Because I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, in the Crenshaw area. And I had almost completed elementary school. And that was the world I knew. And it was a very tight Japanese-American community, the Crenshaw area. Um, there was a Japanese language school there that I attended. Um, I played in a Japanese sports league that was like parallel to Little League, but it was all Japanese-American kids. Um, we had uh, Japanese-American businesses in the area. Um, like other LA residents, we had the Helms Bakery truck come down the street. We had the Ador Milkman deliver milk, and we had a Tofu Man <laughs> would come because because um, that that's what the neighborhood was like at Coliseum Street School, where I went to elementary school. Um, the school was probably 80, 85 percent Japanese American, third generation kids like us. Yes. I taught at Coliseum. No, you taught at Coliseum Street School. It was my first teaching assignment in 1964. Wow. It was still about 90, 95% Japanese American. Oh, really? What? In 1964. That was our last year there. Yeah. We were there at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, so you remember the neighborhood and oh, the school. Oh, absolutely. So you, you, you recall 95%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it was very, very high. I, I, so, so what that meant was that the minority was this small mix of Chinese, blacks, and Jews. And so, um, but the Japanese Americans were the minority. So I grew up a, major, a, a majority. I grew up a majority kid. So what do majority kids learn to do? You bully the minority kids, right? So, um, so I'm going to show you something that, especially if you're not, if you're not Asian American, I want you never to do this. Um, but because a friend of mine did do this, and it was very offensive when she did it in another setting. But I will just confess to you my sin as a child. Um, in our bullying the Chinese children, we did the same thing that we saw little white children do on TV when they bullied Chinese children. So we pulled our eyes back like this, <laughs> and we would chase them around and taunt them with Ching Chong Chinaman type of jeers. Um, we're completely oblivious to the fact that, that structurally, biologically, genetically, we had the same eyes. But we were the bullet. So I grew up, actually, as a majority kid, until I was just about to start junior high school. Um, I did sixth grade at Red Hill Elementary School, literally just up at the end of Red Hill, and, um, and then went to C.E. Utt Intermediate School and Foothill High School. Are you doing okay? Would you like to sit down? No, no. Okay, okay. She's Good. learning things she didn't know about. Okay. <laughs> so, so what happened uh, was that I ran into Tustin in 1965. I don't know how many of you were here in Tustin in 1965, but it was a different place. It was a. Uh, it was very. It was rural. It was extremely white, extremely racist, and it was basically run by the John Birch Society. And so it was, um, and I'm, I'm sorry if any of you are John Birch Society members, I don't mean to offend, but it was, it, it had a very strong political tenor to the town. It was represented in the school board, 
the editor of the Tustin News uh, was very openly a JBS member. Uh, so um, that was my experience running into this world. My sister was three years younger, and LA was actually probably a little scary for her. I did not like it. She did not like LA at all because the. It, they were kind of mean streets. I mean, it was a tough neighborhood. And she was a pretty little sweet, sweet girl. And I was, I was a big guy. I mean, I, in a Japanese American community, I was one of the tallest kids. So I was the center on the basketball team. And, and I, I, so from a world where I was, I was on top of the world, my little sister, what, my younger sister, was suffering. And she was glad to get out of there, and she moved to Tustin and found a bunch of, or she found a group of nice, sweet, polite, kind girls who became really, really good friends to her. My brother, lifelong friends, and my brother had not even started school yet, so he didn't have a recollection of Los Angeles. So we all had this very different experience of what it meant to move here. Uh, for my sister, it was a relief and, and a world of new friends. For my brother, it was just a new start of school. And it was kind of a new, a cool world for him. Kent, Kent my brother, grew up with, uh, he, was it kindergarten? You were on the Art Linkletter show? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he even got to be one of the kids on Art Linkletter. Yeah, kids say the darnest things. And he came home with all these cool toys and stuff. And, he, he had a very different experience growing up than I did. For me, moving to Tustin felt like moving to a, moving from a, a, a bustling, dynamic city to this little cultural backwater of redneck host, racist hostility. That's how it felt to me. Yeah. So in the context of that, um, we all had very different experiences. But, but I think that. Part of what I experienced, the anti-Japanese racism that was still really, I think, more full-blown in Tustin than in some other places, um, it had been present for the decades since the war. There's a sociologist who was at UCLA, uh, Harry Kitano, who was kind of the dean of Asian American studies. And uh, Harry Kitano wrote one of the first books about Japanese Americans called Japanese Americans. And in it, he uses this phrase, and he describes what the Japanese Americans tried to do after the war. And this is his expression, as he observed what Japanese Americans sought to do in U.S. society. And he, he coined it, the Japanese Americans set out to out-white the whites. And what, what he, what, so what this means is you're going to do better in school, you're going to do better at work. You're going to excel. You're going to prove that you're as good as the white people who put you in camp, and you didn't deserve to be in camp, and you are a good, loyal, productive American. And so, um, so I was a part of this whole effort to outwhite the whites. So it was already the case that during the war, Japanese was not taught. In parts of the country, German and Italian weren't taught either. And families of immigrants of all three of those nationalities generally stopped having their children speak those languages because they didn't want to be associated with the enemy. They wanted to demonstrate. I see heads nodding. So maybe some of you had that experience. You might have been German or Italian immigrant families. And then we just don't, don't speak that anymore. So Japanese was like that. And then in the post-war years, it continued to be that way. There was really no encur there was very little encouragement to speak Japanese. So my, uh, although my parents sent me to Japanese school, I didn't learn very much because I hated being there because it was in addition to public school. Uh, what I did learn how to do was to steal candy from Saki's liquor store on the corner, <laughs> and then and then I then I learned how to eat it in class without getting caught by the teacher because if she caught you, she would literally hit you with a stick. And so I got very good at both of those skills. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't think I learned very much Japanese. Um, so all of that to say that we couldn't speak with our grandparents. We could not converse with them. 
because they didn't speak very much English. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was not until I was in my early 30s, and I had an opportunity to study Japanese in an intensive summer course that I took that opportunity because we only had one grandparent left. So my mother's mother was the last grandparent, and I thought, I want to talk to my obachan, and so I want to learn Japanese. So I signed up for this intensive summer course, and uh, it lasted eight weeks, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done academically. It's harder than any other, any other work. It was, it's the uh, Harvard University Summer Intensive Program. Sixty people started in a class. It was, there were more people than this. Thirteen of us finished the class. <laughs> but by the end of the summer, I was dreaming in Japanese. It was a really, really excellent but hard program. So at the end of the summer, we had our family picnic in Gardena, and I went and I sat down next to my bachan, and I said something to her. And she smiled, <laughs> and she answered back to me, and I didn't understand anything she said. <laughs> so I was really not happy, and I was confused, and I said something else to her, and she answered me back, and I still didn't understand what she said. So I, we had this one-way conversation, and she seemed happy and understanding, and I was lost, mostly. So I asked my mom about it, and um, I, just, I was determined, though, to learn how to speak with her. And what I learned was that her Japanese was from a rural Japan, 70 years earlier, Meiji-era Japanese, from a rural portion of Japan, long before NHK had standardized Japanese across the country. So regional dialects were very strong. Plus, it had been in the U.S. for 70 years, so it had become Americanized, kind of like Spanglish, except Japanese version, with Hawaiian influences and pidgin influences. So she spoke a different kind of Japanese than I learned in at Harvard University. <laughs> And so she, um, she understood me because she listened to broadcasts from Japan. So she understood modern Japanese perfectly well, but I couldn't understand what she spoke. So I took my micro cassette co recorder with me. I'd visit her. I'd listen to her. I'd study the tapes. I'd ask my mom for help. And I finally decoded her version of Japanese. So before she died, we were able to have a conversation. It was, uh, it was very... It was very, very meaningful to me and special, and to her, I think. Um, yeah, but that is the, the, I share that because that's one. That's just one example of the kinds of things that result from pieces of history like this that we don't think about the the generational implications of what it does to families, and then what happens to children like us who then encounter people from Japan who say, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? What kind of Japanese are you? You can't speak Japanese. So that's a, very, that's a rather common experience that people in my Jap generation have experienced when going to visit Japan. So I, I'm, I feel very fortunate and, and rather unusual in being of my generation and act, able to converse somewhat. Um, anyway. Thanks, Mom. <laughs>
and that is one of the exhibit halls, and they built two barracks, and it's called Demonstration Block 14, and it's uh, Barrack 1, when you enter that, it's like, it first was when you went to camp, with the straw mattresses and the uh, iron cots and bare walls and no, uh, no flooring except the pine boards. And then uh, you go into block uh, barrack eight, and it's how the Japanese fixed up the rooms. Because, you know, we didn't live like that for two years. Well, we, well I was only there for two years, but we, people then put curtains on their windows, and, and eventually the camp uh, management put in uh, wall boards so that we didn't have the exposed frames, and they put in linoleum on the floor to protect us uh, from the dust and the wind coming up. So um, that's what block, uh, Barrack 8 is like, <coughs> Barrack 1 and Barrack 8. Thank you for sharing that. Would you, you introduce yourself again, please? Oh, I'm uh, Joyce Okazaki Nakamura, formerly. And I have one other uh, comment, and that was the question about reunions. There are reunions. There is a reunion, actually, of the, the uh, Jerome Roar people. Uh, I don't belong to that group, but they have reunions occasionally. And there's uh, pilgrimages. And uh, once a year, Manzanar has a pilgrimage. And this is the program from the last pilgrimage, which I will give to um, somebody who will share it. Uh, it uh, has a lot of different uh, stories about the pilgrimage. And also, there's going to be a very big pilgrimage in Heart Mountain, Wyoming. And they call it the All Camps hmm. Pilgrimage. So it includes Jerome and Roar. Gila River and Poston, the Topaz, uh, Minidoka, and uh, all the other cats. Well, Thank you, Joyce. I wanted Joyce to introduce herself in case you came in late. Joyce lived in Manzanar. She was a child in Manzanar. I believe there is a book that's out of print now, which is called The Road to Manzanar. Oh, no. Do you know that, Joyce? No, I haven't. Seen that one, but I've seen the one that Ansel Adams. No, this wrote. is a text, not photographs. Is um, it a is it a novel for you? Is it a story? No, it's uh, hmm. about what really went on in hmm. the scenario you were describing. You know, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that either. Created it as let's say a home away from home. Yes. Obviously, Question. Yeah, um, I am Jewish, so huh? of course the Holocaust is very big. Steven Spielberg yes. has a whole foundation where they've been filming the survivors um, right. in our temple. Very every month there's a luncheon for the survivors. Right. Is there anything or form that is saving these stories? Yes. Uh, where there is. Well, it's happening in various places. There are oral history projects. Uh, there is also an organization specifically dedicated to the stories of veterans of the 442, the Go For Broke organization. Um, there is some excellent work that's been done in the Oral History Project at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, it, some, of the, some of the really great oral history work has been done there. Um, the Japanese American National Museum. Yes, the Japanese American National Museum does great work. They have an archives office in there. Uh, people can actually go in and find their camp, their names in the camp records. And uh, Reverend Kathy Sires is going to make an invitation at the end for you to join a field trip there where she's got a guided tour plan. There are other reunion experiences also in other places. Um, the Santa Anita Racetrack has, on occasion, invited former internees to come back and take a tour. Um, my mother has done that. Um, I, I personally have never uh, been to Santa Anita, and I've never really wanted to go to Santa Anita. Um, I remember the impression I had of Santa Anita when wa I was watching it from Boston, 1984. We were in grad I was in grad school. We rented a little TV to watch the Olympics, and, and I was waiting for some word about L.A. Uh, the, watch the marathon run right by where we used to live, right, right next to Bachan's house on Exposition. Um, 
And then I watched the equestrian events, and I, I, I saw this beautiful Santa Anita racetrack. It was, it was immaculate. It was gorgeous. And it was the era when there were a lot of up close and personal stories being done about the Olympics, and I was expecting something to be said about the history of Santa Anita, and nothing was said about its use as a, uh, an assembly center. And it felt like, um, just felt like a very insulting whitewash to me. And I was disappointed, and I, I, I've, I've just never had a happy relationship to racetracks. Uh, Tanforan Racetrack in San Francisco was also used. Uh, and the other assembly centers were largely uh, county. fairgrounds, county fairgrounds, and in Salinas it was a rodeo ground. Uh, those were assembly centers. They were, they were where people were gathered up immediately while the camps were still being built. Uh, some of them were still being planned. but um, So people stayed there for six, up to six months. Uh, the camps generally had about 10,000 people in each of them. Uh, Santa Anita, I believe, had 19,000 people at its peak. Yeah, and the first people lived in stalls, horse stalls, but those filled up. So more than half of the people lived in quickly built barracks for that time also. Um, let me tell you one more story, and then I, I, I want to entertain uh, questions also. And, and I want to give preference to the bookies and to the book club people. I want to give preference to people who've read the book. I mean, if you read the book, you might have come here with questions, and, and we might want to discuss those. But let me tell you a story about my mom's Father. So this is this is our our grandfather, uh, Linda's grandfather. Um, I never heard this story till last year. Um, no, it's now it's been almost two years. But until I was until I was uh, sixty, I never heard this story. But. Because Harbor City, where they lived, was near the harbor, it was considered militarily sensitive, and so they were the very first people to be picked up. So like my mother said, they were some of the very first people to enter Santa Anita, and they were picked up on four days' notice, and they had to liquidate everything. And even in Reeves' book, he talks about how some people uh, destroyed their own things rather than sell them for pennies and be cheated. And, uh, but people did try to liquidate as quickly as they could, or they just abandoned things. My father, our, our, my, our grandfather, had a farmhand, a Mexican-American. His name was, they called him Pidoro, which I'm sure is Pedro. <laughs> but, um, but you can't say Pedro in Japanese. So he, he was called Pidoro, and Pidoro was um, very trusted and beloved by my grandfather. My mother remembers him as a very kind man, a good man, that would sit with them in the home and she, would, she could sit on his lap and he would share tortillas with her and he worked very hard and he walked to work at the farm and then he would walk home. They didn't, really didn't know where he came from. So in those four days prior to having to leave and drive their car to Santa Anita, uh, where they caravaned, as she said, and then she didn't mention that once they got there, they had to drive their own cars to Santa Anita, and then once they got there, they had the privilege of auctioning their cars for $25 to people who would buy them there. Uh, but before they drove away, my grandfather decided uh, he was going to do something different from everybody else. So he gave everything to, um, excuse me, to Pidoro. So um, I just think this is so profound. Uh, to go against the grain of common sense and utility and where everyone else is trying to cash out, to simply say, so we'll have a few dollars less, but, but a Mexican-American man gets a whole new start with a whole new life. Um, I'm very proud of that. 
I think it explains something about my mom, too, uh, about the generosity of the family. That's always been a characteristic of their family. They're just so, so generous. My mother's parent, my mother's mother was always so generous. She loved to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> and she always seemed to win. <laughs> always. I don't know how that works. But she always seemed to win. But she always was giving money away. They're just very generous people. And um, I love the story of Pidoro. So, um, any of you who've read the book have any questions, any things you want to discuss? Yes? I read the book. I also was a child um, that got evacuated. I didn't go to camp. Ah. My father uh, opted just to drive inland. Ah. Uh, so we ended up in Utah. Uh -huh. and I wish to this day that I'd asked him, how did you know to go there? I mean, what was your... Did you have a pathway? Did you just start driving or what? And yeah. we all, I mean, we're getting into this truck and we all had our belongings and going. And then we just ended up in this little town. But, uh, Where? What town? Springville. Okay. Um, but anyway, but getting back to the uh, book, um, I was just amazed at all the national papers that are so well renowned now how they all jumped into the hysteria without yeah. any verification of facts. Yeah. I mean, that was the most striking thing about how everybody just jumped yeah. and published it and just spread. The yeah. hysteria just got yeah. so terrible. And I thought, you know, in this day and age, I think that still happens. Absolutely. Just, uh, well, I, 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 I think so, too. Kind, yeah. The only person that really, and I didn't, I think I did know it, but Hoyles of the... That had a registered world. He was the only one that believed that oh, they shouldn't have done that because you know we were citizens. Japanese were citizens. But you know, they're just small voices in the wilderness. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That that's a I resonated with that too. Death. Uh, your grandfather on my side mm -hmm. decided that he, we were in area A which meant that we would have four days' notice to pack up, sell, and move into camp and to Salinas Rodeo Ground. My father decided he, he came to this country as a youngster, worked all his life, and he was not going to become a prisoner. And so we moved to Area B, which was east of Highway 99, only to find out six months later we were also in camp. But the difference between Mickey and I, she went in first. We were one of the last groups to go <coughs> in. Gila camp was not finished. And you might have learned that it might have been a genetic, genetic thing you learned from me. Since we walked into an empty barrack, as she described, we had no place to sit. We had no tables or anything. So every, they were still building the camp, so every night we would go out and, what's a good term? We would accept the lumber that they left. Appropriate. We <laughs> 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 would have borrowed it. And the most precious thing we had, we were looking for, were nails. Because if you had lumber, you had to assemble it, and we had no glue. We had no wood screws, so we would look for nails. And we would look, we looked on the ground everywhere we walked, and we recognized people by their shoes. <laughs> we never looked up, we looked down. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was an interesting part of our camp experience. And again, if I might say something, the experience of camp life depend upon your age and also where you came from. I mean, what part of the United States you were living. But uh, for the old folks, our parents, my parents and your grandparents, uh, it was a traumatic thing because they lost everything. They worked all those years to develop a good life for themselves and their children, and then suddenly taken from them. Uh, from my your uncle's standpoint, uh, Jennifer's uh, father, 
he was at an age where he was just getting started and he lost the opportunity to do something with his life and that was very dramatic. My generation, I was seven years younger and I was a high school, uh, junior in high school and it was like a summer camp. I never had so much fun in all my life because I, I lived on a farm, my closest neighbor was a half a mile away I went to a one-room school with eight students from grade one through grade eight, uh, eight, and so I never learned how to play team sports, but I had the opportunity to do so, and uh, it was a different life. Yeah. So. Thank you, Dad, for sharing that. The other, uh, I, the the uh, that's a really important point to make about how age affects the experience that one had. Uh, aside from losing what had been earned prior to camp, another dynamic that happened, and I, and I experienced the fallout of this, I believe, when I served as the pastor of a Japanese American congregation, that if you were parents and you were raising your children in ways that any of us might consider more traditional, you're suddenly in a large barrack situation and eating in mess halls. So whereas the family dinner was a significant time where parents would hold forth and discipline and, and community was built in a family, now moms don't cook, dads don't sit at the table, children don't sit there, the children run around in packs, and it was, it, it, it decimated the family structure that had been traditional, too. So it was extremely, I mean, it just multiplied the trauma if you were parents. My brother had his hand up. Um, I was just, something just made sense to me as to, about my father. Huh. And that was growing up, when we would take things apart, because he taught me to take <laughs> things apart and put things together, and now I understand why he always took every nail out. To this day, I have this tendency to have this huge jar of usable nails and screws. <laughs> Trickle down. Um, I had a little bit of a different experience. Uh, my mother was in high school, and she finished high school in the camps. Hmm. But when she got out, they forced her to go back to school for another year hmm. uh, because they didn't honor her education that she received in the camps. Hmm. My grandfather had owned a produce business. They owned their own home, a car, and of course, they lost all of that. So after the war ended, he, my family, my, they ended up in Chicago, and a good number of Japanese people ended up there. And, uh, but after the war, my grandfather left and went back to Japan. So unfortunately, I never knew my grandparents mm. at all. Mm. Uh, and then one of the other things, unlike you, I'm a baby boomer. And I'm, uh, my parents, for whatever reason, they met in Chicago, and then they came out to California, and they settled in San Pedro. Huh. And we were like the only Asian kids there. Huh. I didn't get the opportunity yeah. to grow up within our culture. Right. So, um, and then when I was exposed to Japanese kids, and I think it was um, high school, that's how long it took, uh, I just didn't feel like I belonged in that group, right. but then again, I didn't know we're outside the right. either. So, um, and uh, my father worked two jobs to put five of us kids through college without any student loans, so we rarely saw my dad, and my mom didn't know how to cook Japanese food. So it wasn't until my mid-30s when I started working in uh, sales for a bank, and I was trying to get this Japanese client, that I actually learned how to eat Japanese food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to this day, I still don't use chopsticks well, and to this day, my mother, who is 89, and she, uh, she can't even use chopsticks, so it's sort of, you know, funny. but we didn't grow up around Japanese food, yeah. culture, or any of that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Big loss for us. Thank you for sharing that story. Oh, and then one other thing. Yeah. Now, I don't have this, but my father was a U.S. postal worker prior to the war. 
and I didn't know because my mother never talked about her experience in the camp. Uh, it wasn't until my daughter, who was in junior high school at the time, she's now 40, she said, Mom, I have to speak to somebody who was alive during World War II. So I said, well, the only one I know is your grandma, that my mother opened up about the camp. She mm. never talked about it to mm. us all these years. Yeah. And in growing up, I was exposed to a lot of prejudice. And so people, the kids would come to school and say, my dad was in the Army, my dad was in the Navy, and brag. And I would go home and ask my mom, well, what about my dad? What did my dad do? And I thought she was kidding, but she wasn't. And she said they thought he was a spy. So I never said anything. I just sort of dropped it and let it go. But an interesting thing was, I found out prior to that my father was going to a junior college and wanted to become a doctor. And of course, when all of this happened, he lost that uh, desire to do that. But when he got out, he ran the post office in the camp. And then after he got out, he went back to get his regular job and they refused to give it back to him. And so Richard Nixon happened to be the congressman for the area that my father was living in. Huh. my parents were living in, and he got a special bill passed in Congress saying that they had to reinstate my dad back to his, his position in the post office, and uh, later hmm. he came to the law for Wow. <laughs> the nicest thing I've ever heard said about Richard. <laughs> 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 he actually did something to help the Japanese America. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, there is a, um, hmm. yeah. um, different people have such different experiences, and, and every, every camp was different also. Um, the conditions were different. Um, I was reminded of a couple of stories my dad has told over the years that I think point out the absurdity of the camps, in a sense, in that there were guards guarding the camps, but they were in the middle of the desert. Gila River is in the middle of the desert. It's on the Pima River, P Pima Indian Reservation, in the middle of nowhere. Where are you going to go? So where are you going to go, <laughs> yeah. right? Where are you going to go? But there's guards circling the camp with jeeps and lights, but one of the things that people would do would be to go fishing. Well, to do that, or, or, or they would go out of camp to have a bonfire outside of camp. So how do you do that? Well, the jeep circles around the camp, and so you just wait till the jeep turns the corner, and then you've got time to go out, and you can go out through the barbed wire, and they would take the tent posts that were wooden and take them out into the desert and have a bonfire out in the desert. Well, it's hard to hide a bonfire in the middle yeah. of the desert. <laughs> but where are people going to go? So people could go, some, some would go fishing. There's a, there's a little movie called The Men's in Our Fishing Club. Um, and there's one story that I love my dad shared with me about a guy who had just gone out hiking into, he just went walking far and he ran across a, a Native American uh, running this little trading post. And um, in camp, it was hard to get commodities and blue jeans were quite a commodity. But this, this Native American running this trading post was getting this constant supply of government <laughs> issue of blue jeans. And he had this stack of blue jeans like he's never going to sell. Well, this perfect opportunity came. So this guy, this enterprising Japanese-American guy, will hike out to the trading post, buy these blue jeans, and bring them back to camp. People are happy to have blue jeans, and this guy turned a profit on the blue jeans, thanks to the US government's provision of blue jeans to the Native Americans. So, there are so many absurd things about camp. Um, I have a question, and, and I, I appreciate the comments about 
Um, especially your comment about how the press just jumped on the story, uh, went along with the propaganda, and didn't check facts, or didn't want to see the facts, actually. We're part of a campaign to create a certain kind of image. Uh, the Hearst papers were very big in this, and had been since the late 19th century, actually, in the creation of the whole yellow peril fear in California. It started going back to the, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, when Chinese laborers then came flooding back into San Francisco, undercutting the labor market. So you can read the Hearst papers of those days talking about the Chinese as living like vermin in the, and reproducing like vermin in the sewers under the streets of San Francisco. So this whole notion of anti-Japanese, anti-Asian sentiment had been promulgated by the Hearst papers and by all kinds of people, even, even an author, uh, named Theodore, uh, Theodore Gazelle, Theodore Zoys Gazelle, yes, who we know as Dr. Seuss, uh, produced some of these. Um, one of the things that also strikes me about Reeves' book is, is how I think he really clearly lays out the level of incompetence of military leaders at the time. And um, today, I would hope that with uh, the kind of fact-checking that's available online, that we might be less susceptible to that. But I don't believe that we are invulnerable to that. And as a matter of fact, I see it happen all the time still. So I, I think that the book is a, is a valuable reminder of how military political, and business, because clearly agribusiness had a huge part in this. Um, one thing that Reeves doesn't talk much about is the whole redress movement. Um, this is a very significant piece also that I think goes to respond to the question, why didn't you all talk about this earlier? My contention is that it's very hard to talk about something when Textbooks, news records, your neighbors all say anything from it wasn't that bad to it didn't really happen. And I remember in the 60s, the late 60s at Foothill High School, the up the road, in my US history book looking for any bit of acknowledgement that this happened. And it just wasn't there. So I had Alan Bosworth's new book and I have my U.S. history book, and there's some kind of a disconnect here. Um, many people were just told it wasn't that bad, or it couldn't have really been that bad, or even it couldn't have really happened. There are deniers. Um, but one thing that happened was that some kids my age, who were not camp survivors, but it grew up as part of this Out White the Whites campaign, and they became lawyers. And not only that, lawyers of our age who grew up during the civil rights era and uh, went to school during a time of heightened ethnic awareness and uh, yellow power consciousness, and they started to understand what happened, and they said, this is not right. And so they started to take up a few legal cases of, of people who had been, uh, they had been found guilty of disloyalty to the United States because they violated curfew during those early days after World War II, or after Pearl Harbor. These young hotshot lawyers, they took up this case and they started to get some traction. During the 80s, some other things happened. Uh, um, certain government documents became declassified. And some of this information about how the motivation was so much about money. Because as Reeves points out, Japanese American farmers were producing 40% of the produce in California yeah. on about 10% of the land. There were certain crops in which they were producing 60% of the market on 10% of the land. 
So if you can get rid of these Jap farmers, you can get a big market share back. And so that kind of correspondence was revealed. Um, there was also, um, well, so, so the, that kind of correspondence was revealed. Um, there was a press made to work towards a redress resolution for this. And in the course of that, it got pushed and pushed and pushed by this movement to the point that there were congressional hearings held across the country during the mid-80s, mid to late 80s. At these congressional hearings now, large public events with congressional representatives sitting there listening to survivors of camp tell their stories publicly, people started to say things out loud they had never said before. They started to tell stories they'd never told to anyone before, not their own family, and they're saying it in public to a congressional panel. And it opened the floodgates of stories. So prior to the mid to late 80s, there were very, very few pieces of evidence that you could find. Uh, literature, documentary, very little. But after the late 80s, there was this flood of material. I remember when I started seminary I, in 1983, I had about every book there was on the Japanese American experience, I felt. I mean, I had every major work on a little shelf. By the time I finished seminary in 88, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't contain them all. It was just this flood of material that happened. So, so there was good reason, I think, why people didn't tell this story earlier on. Um, I'd like to play for you a clip. I'd like you to hear something. Sorry, I had difficulty before too. Um, what this is, it's a newsreel from the wartime of the story of the Lost Battalion. And that story is in the book, a group of the uh, soldiers of the 442nd who rescued a group of Texan, Texas soldiers who were trapped under German gunfire in the hills of France. And this, um, a, a crazy commanding officer sent the Japanese troops in to rescue this group of trapped Texas soldiers, even though it was impossible, it would have seemed. But the Japanese American soldiers actually pressed through and rescued the, um, oh, I really wish you could hear this. Try refreshing the page. What's that? Try refreshing the, it's a,
Texas Division had been cut off and lay trapped up forward in the hills without communications and surrounded by superior enemy forces. <coughs> While a unit battled ahead to relieve them, they held on grimly day after bitter day. Medical supplies and rations were fired to them by artillery. A near miss would have been useless here. The shells had to land squarely on the target or else fall into enemy hands. It was the 442nd Infantry Division that was ordered to cut a way through to them. This was the famous and unique battalion composed of Americans of Japanese ancestry. Volunteers all. They were fighting as they had fought in Italy to prove their loyalty to their American homeland, to prove again that democracy embraces all creeds, all races. For nine days, while the Texans hung on grimly up ahead, they cut their way forward in bitter cold and in some of the toughest fighting country on the Western Front. They took prisoners, sometimes in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and on the tenth day, they broke their way through. The lost battalion of the Second World War had been relieved. Tired men, tired to exhaustion, but unbeaten. Here are the men who fought in that trap. They came out with their wounded and with their dead. They will not forget those nine days they fought in the Vosges. Look at this man's eyes. <laughs> These are the sorts of men for whom words like courage and doggedness are used by the historians. Look well at all these men. These are the sorts of men about whom legends are started. Someday they'll say, I was in the 36th, the Texans. We were up in the Vosges, and once we were cut off for nine days. And what of the troops who got through to them? The 442nd. They came out too when it was over, carrying their wounded. These two are the kinds of men about whom fine words are sometimes used. These two are Americans, and they've proved it with the full measure of their loyalty. They too fought during those nine bitter days. They too brought back their wounded. They too brought back their dead. thing I wanted to point out and have you here is the, the way these two groups of men are described. This is a description again of the Texans who were rescued. These are the sorts of men for whom words like courage and doggedness are used by the historians. Look well at all these men. These are the sorts of men about whom legends are started. Someday they'll say, I was in the 36th, the Texans. We were up in the Vosges, and once we were cut off for nine days. And if you go to Texas, to the areas where these men were from, those people love Japanese American soldiers. There were many more 442nd troops who were casualties than the Texans who were rescued. Um, at the end of at the end of the event, there were some medals to be handed out, and so the commanding officer ordered the leader of the Japanese American soldiers to muster up the troops to hand out the medals. And he called them up, and then the commanding officer, with medals in hand, scolded the leader and said, "I told you to get all your men here." And he said, this is all that's left, sir. 
Uh, and this is what the news brought back to the states about one of the troops who got through to them, the 442nd. They came out too when it was over, carrying their wounded. These two are the kinds of men about whom fine words are sometimes used. These two are Americans and about whom fine words are sometimes used. Um, well, and then, and they actually they do proved show. it with the full measure of their loyalty. They too fought during those nine bitter days. They too brought back their wounded. They too brought back their dead. Um, this this kind of, of of propaganda that was a part of to the report of a of one young Hispanic man supposedly armed. Um, there was apparently a shooting incident later. It wasn't reported who shot, uh, but the gun was never found. They finally did apprehend the man in an apartment. But let me let me let me share with you something that is. I, that I find um, fascinating. So this was the response, okay? Um, so there was the Orange County Sheriff Department brought this helicopter. Uh, the helicopter is lifting off to join the search for a man who reportedly had a gun intestine. Sorry, it cuts off the bottom line. A SWAT team from Irvine pulls up. A SWAT team uh, enters the complex there on Mitchell Avenue in Tustin. Uh, these are photos from the Orange County Register. Uh, a, the deputy checks the car's trunk. Uh, look for a man reportedly seen walking with a sawed-off shotgun near a Tustin apartment complex. Uh, shots were fired when police officers confronted a man reportedly was seen walking with a sawed-off shotgun Thursday morning, officials said, as an Irvine police SWAT vehicles race away from a staging area on Red Hill Avenue. A SWAT officer tries unsuccessfully to catch up and jump on. SWAT members ride on the outside of an Orange County Sheriff's Department helicopter as it circles a Tustin neighborhood where police were searching for a man seen with a gun Thursday morning. SWAT members ride on the, on the Sheriff's <laughs> helicopter uh, SWAT officers of the Newport Beach Police Department. Uh, California Highway Patrol helicopter joins the search. So in response to that report, the Tustin Police, Tustin SWAT, Irvine SWAT, Newport Beach SWAT, California Highway Patrol, Orange County Sheriff, and federal agents, and multiple helicopters with armed agents on the side runners. There was a shooting incident. No one was injured. They chased the young man into an apartment and eventually apprehended him. No gun has been found. Multiple schools were closed down, including CEA, where I went. Tustin High was closed. Seven schools were closed. My question is, was this an overreaction? <laughs> and I thought about this incident, actually, when I was reading the book. And I thought about what happened when there was the... The, the one submarine, lone submarine, that did shoot onto the land of California caused, I think, $500 of damage. And in response then, there was the night of the, 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 the night in Los Angeles when anti-aircraft guns for an hour went off. I think five people died because, I think, two or three from heart attacks, from panic, and two or three from the, just the, 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 his, the, pan, the hysteria of trying to get out of Los Angeles. It was like one of these earthquake or tidal wave movies. Um, and people died because of this, this hysterical response. And the next day, it was discovered that it was a U.S. weather sat balloon that was in the air. But the next day, the headlines talk about this necessary military response to the threat of to the Japanese air threat. So, I, my point is that I think we're all still very susceptible to this, and that we do this all the time. That there are 
issues related to immigration these days, ideas that people have about what Hispanic and Latino immigrants are like, uh, confused and, and misrepresented stories about the impact and of, of immigrants. Um, I think that this, is signif this kind of understanding is significant for understanding what we've been experiencing in the U.S. for the last 12 months now, since Ferguson first blew up last August. I think, uh, I know that in the, in the black communities where I uh, live and work in fellowship, um, there's a very different sense of what, what the narrative is of black people. And, and I, I encounter people who are very frustrated by hearing Black Lives Matter again and again. But I, I have to tell you that in black communities, um, for people who have experienced this kind of sy systematic, systemic storytelling and narrative that paints them in a certain way so they get treated a certain way consistently by law enforcement, by by business, by society, by churches, it's, it's, a, it's a very real thing. So let me tell you one last story. It is a, it's a personal story. It's about when I drove across the country to go to seminary in 1983. It was, so it was 1983, this is before redress. This was before there were a lot of stories about the Japanese American experience. But in 1982, Vincent Chin, was a young man in Detroit. And he was out celebrating with his brother for his birthday, I believe. And at the bar where they were, they ran into two men, a father and son, unemployed auto workers. And they made some comments to Vincent Chin uh, about how the Japs were taking their jobs. And so they were upset with Vincent Chin, a Chinese American man, for ruining their lives because of the economic threat, because the Japanese auto industry was doing quite well against Detroit at those times. So there was a lot of unemployment in Detroit. They exchanged some harsh words and they left the bar. Vincent Chin left, the father and son went and got a baseball bat and they chased down Vincent Chin and they beat him to death with a baseball bat. The story became news because of the death but then in the, over the next year, the story became even greater news in the Asian American community because there was such a very small penalty meted out to the, to the uh, men who killed Vincent Chin. And um, I think it was a few thousand dollars and probation, I think. Um, but it caused outrage in the Asian American community through that year, and then the next summer, I was going to drive to Boston. I was, I'm, I'm just confessing to you this, I was afraid to drive near Detroit. I was driving a small Datsun, a Japanese import. I, my wife is white, a beautiful white woman with me in a Japanese car. I just was afraid to drive near Detroit. Was I paranoid? Was this unreasonable? What I know is that when I got near Detroit, I knew I could drive about 320 miles on a tank of gas. So I looked at the map and I stopped 160 miles before, and I filled up so I could drive straight through so I wouldn't have to stop. I just didn't even want to be in a gas station. Was I paranoid? Was there something actually to be afraid of? I got to Boston, and when I got to Boston, Quickly that fall, there was a story of a police officer in the Chinatown area, which is right next to the red light district in Boston. And he was chasing a suspect, found a Chinese American man, and believing that it was the suspect he was pursuing, caught the man and just pummeled him in the face until he was unconscious and in the hospital. There was a prostitute there who yelled at the cop, Kelly, that's not the guy. Interesting, the prostitute knew the policeman's name. <laughs> but, 
Um, the, the Asian American community in Boston was outraged that, uh, by this violence. Um, was this an isolated incident? Um, I don't know. Um, there was also tension between um, Vietnamese and Southeast Asian fisher people who had moved both to the Gulf of Mexico and the northeastern seaboard because they fished and they were good at it. They were providing competition, not in farming, but in fishing. And so along the New England seaboard, people were eager to have these Vietnamese fisher people out of there. So they were burning boats and they were, um, they were destroying Vietnamese uh, fishing boats in anger over an economic motivation. On I-95, not far from our house, where we lived on the North Shore, north of Boston, there was an incident that happened that same year where some young white guys in their car spotted some young Asian American guys, they were Southeast Asian guys, um, in a car. They ran their car off the road on I-95, pulled the guys out of the car, and beat them up. This was near where I lived. So all of these things happened in sequence. It might have been, it might have been coincidence. Uh, but I can tell you this, that during the time I lived in Boston, I was afraid of the police. I would walk to the other side of the street when I saw police. I just didn't trust police. This is the experience of someone who was in my early 30s, fairly well experienced, moderately intelligent, fairly reasonable, fairly well read, and I was terrified. Based on the experiences of basically events within a year. So when I think of my black friends, who've experienced this kind of insanely in unjust treatment for generations. The fact that they may th be suspicious of the intent of some police makes perfectly good sense to me. I'm really grateful for this book because I think that what it does is it helps us to it helps us to remember that the, the stories that are told publicly aren't always the whole story. Mm -hmm. And that we need to examine uh, the things we assume about people who are different from us. Um, one of the great things about my friendship with Betty over the years has been that we're, we're rather different from each other in many ways. Although we, we look a lot alike, but except, <laughs> except for that, we're, we're different in a lot of ways. But um, Betty is the kind of person who, when people are different, she doesn't run. She leans in and connects. And, and I, 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 do, I so believe that what we need to do in the face of difference is not run away and hide and create a gated suburban community to keep those dark people out, we need to, we need to lean in and we need to connect. And Betty's been such a model, going back to the 60s and black-white relationships in the rural South, and she's done so, she's a crazy lady. <laughs> Some of the stuff in, in, in inner city Santa Ana that she did is amazingly ahead of a lot of the church. So I'm very grateful for you, Betty. Thank you. And uh, thanks for this time. We're at the end of our time, and Kathy's got an announcement. Okay. But we'll turn it back to Betty. Well, thank you, Kathy. going to the Japanese American National Museum this coming Friday. It's quite near City Hall in LA. We're taking the train and we have a tour arranged at the museum at 11.30. We have 10 spots left. The tour maximum is 30. So if you would like to be part of our tour, 
be happy to have you sign up. You can get there any way you want. You can go on the train like we are, or you can drive. And I've got the info here if you'd like to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to give those spots away at church tomorrow. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and, uh, you know, we can read the books, and we can look at the pictures, and we can even go to Manzanar and see some of that, but to hear personal stories just puts it together, doesn't it, in some new ways? And I just want to thank Mickey for all you've shared with us today. but uh, also for the rest of the Yamaguchi. You don't call it a clan, do you? No, it's just a group of people, a family, yes. And for Bill, for your participation too. And all of the others that uh, have touched our hearts if you've shared your story, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you all for coming. Um, I like being called a crazy lady. No, you are. <laughs> Because, you know, I get this little tiny seed, and then it becomes, woo, that's exciting. And then on the way down, I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to do next? <laughs> I'm already thinking of next. And I'm thinking of how about next summer we start spreading the word with a book on some other subject. How about we bring in, uh, you know, what's happening in the whole issue of immigration and have people come and share their stories if you, as you have shared and as others have shared. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could do. Anybody interested in reading a really good book next summer and then have us come together and talk about it? There you go. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I, want, I want to respond to a couple of things. First okay. of all, uh, my family, you, you listen to the name Yamaguchi. We are the Maguchi clan, so it's our it is clan. Yeah, it's our it's okay. Scottish heritage. It's the Maguchi. <laughs> um, but um, I, I forgot to point out this picture that was on the wall behind yeah, me. It's an this, important picture. This is the building of the church where I was the pastor, Grace Presbyterian Church in Long Beach. This was this, so it's your church. But this is the old property in downtown Long Beach. This was uh, Friday, August 28, 1942. And the headline reads, Church once used by Japs serves new boys club. Maybe hard to read this. It says, uh, Boys club to use the church. The former Japanese church showed above to become the house of newly organized. Long oh, no, that's not what I'm looking for. There's a line in here. That's great. It says, three years of planning by a group of leading Long Beach citizens will be uh, dedicated. De dedicated early next month with the organization of a boys club designed to serve all boys regardless of race or creed. <laughs> I pre that's the perfect gesture. <laughs> what are we saying? And I think we do this all the time. So I love Betty's idea. One of the, I mean, if you did something on, if you were to do something on trying to, since I noticed that um, there are not very many African American people here. Have you noticed? Yeah, that? and and I've noticed that about. Orange County in general, um, I think to engage some of those questions, there are some provocative things. Uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates has written some profound things trying to illuminate the experience of life in the U.S. as a, mm -hmm. as a black man. Um, I think that would be rich. Mm -hmm. So and the, and I the applaud story, you. The historians from uh, Cal State Florida. Yeah. have written on the uh, uh, African-American experience in Orange yep. County. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Be easy to well, yeah. thanks for anyway, what you do, Betty. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. There's, there's, uh, there's enough uh, food out there to feed the Russian army.